what is a completable future and what do we use it for? Completable future is used to perform possible asynchronous computations and trigger its dependent computations which could also be asynchronous. When I say asynchronous, I mean non-blocking operations. So in Java, to perform a non-blocking operation has always been easy. You simply create a new runnable, you run it in a separate thread and once that runnable calls a run method and run method is completed, that thread is destroyed. As simple as that. If the task that you want to run also is returning a value back, you could use something called as callable. So you again create a new thread, complete the thread and return back the variable that you want in the main thread. And we typically do this using executor service. Let's look at the, some code for it. So here we have an executor service which is of the type fixed thread pool. The thread count is 10 and we say submit a new task. This new task is nothing but an instance of callable which returns the type integer. If you see the method it does nothing special it is just returning a random integer. So we say submit this new task and give me the result. But since it's a callable result and it can take a while you do not want your main thread to be blocking what the service does is it immediately gives you a placeholder value of the type future. So it says that okay I will execute the task but it might take some time so I'm not going to give you the value immediately neither I'm going to stop you from running this main thread. Instead what I'll do is I'll just give you a placeholder. Keep that placeholder with you and do something else for a while. Once I'm ready and I've completed the task I'll put the value in the future. So after a while when you say future.get if by this time the task is completed you will get the actual value in this variable called result. If by any chance this task is not completed then the future.get call will be a blocking. That means that this thread will wait at this point until this task gets completed. And once that's done, you'll get the result and you can do further operations using that result. In this case, we are just doing a system.out.println with that result. To visualize this, we have a thread pool on the right. We have this main thread on the left, which is submitting the tasks. So we are just saying service.submit a new task and it's immediately giving us back a placeholder. If you see the placeholder, it's nothing but an empty box, which means it doesn't have its value. So it's not yet executed the task, it's just taken that task. After a while, once the result is ready, the thread pool will set the value of this placeholder, which is of type future, and that value will be whatever the result is. So in this case, the value is three. But as we saw in the code earlier, if the main thread is doing future.get operation before that task is run, your main thread which is calling the future.get can get blocked. And again after a while, once the value of that future is set to 3, then your main thread becomes runnable and it can be scheduled again by the JVM immediately. So, so you see there is a problem here because your main thread is being blocked. Now this problem becomes even more cumbersome when you have multiple tasks to be submitted. So let's say here we are submitting four tasks. So in a for loop we have for one to four submit these four tasks. And immediately the thread pool will give you four future values, right? These four future values, if you do a for loop again and you say future.get, so in this case you're doing a future.get on the first one, right? And since the thread pool cannot guarantee that the first task will be completed before the task second or task third or task four, it is possible that your task three and your task four are already completed. And as you can see, those tasks have already the value. So the placeholder is not blank anymore. It already has the value of seven and five. And yet, since we are doing a blocking operation future.get, in the for loop, which by its very nature, for loop will target the first element first, 
we will get a blocking on the main thread after a while once the thread pool calculates the value of the first task so let's say in this case the value is 1 only then your main thread will be able to run and then complete any dependent tasks so the problem was even though there were many tasks which were completed since we used a for loop to do a future dot get we were not able to do anything about these values 7 and 5 until the value of the first task was completed let's take a more practical example so let's say we have a certain set of code which is divided into multiple methods and each method is responsible for a particular task so let's say we have methods for fetching an order for enriching that order fits up with some more details for making the payments for that order for dispatching the order and for sending the confirmation email for that order so in essence for an order flow we have five particular tasks fetch enrich payment dispatch and email if you want to convert this into code we would write something like this so you would again create an executor service which is of type fixed thread pool we are going to submit the task and the task number one is get order task this task which is of the callable nature will get the order which is to be processed in this case the service will not give us the value because the task is not yet executed it will instead give us its future when we perform the future dot get which is potentially a blocking operation since we are doing it immediately this thread will have to wait until that order is really fetched once that order is fetched we again create a new task which is enrich task with that order we submit it again to this executor service which will again give another future on which we can do future one dot get of course potentially since we just submitted this task and we are trying to get a value of it this thread will again block we can repeat the same thing for performing the payment for dispatching the order and for sending an email each of these tasks are potentially blocking because we are using futures for it and since it is blocking and since that whole thing is being done one after the other if we have a for loop over this we will not be able to do anything about the order 2 order 3 order 4 or order 5 until we completely process the order 1 right that means our main thread this thread will not be able to scale much further it is almost like a sequential operation where it has to complete order 1 before getting an order 2 of course which is not scalable at all so there is a dependency of say enrich order on the fetch order because enrich order cannot work before the fetch order is completed right so there is a certain dependency between these tasks for that particular order but a thread theoretically could be doing a payment operation for this order while there is another thread which is doing enrich order for another order which is completely possible which is completely practical and which is what we really need to scale up our ordering processing right so what we want is we want say n number of threads so in this case we want 10 threads all doing processing of one particular flow so this is what we mean by having independent flows within one flow the tasks are dependent on each other but one flow is not at all dependent on other flow so if we convert this into an algorithm what we really want is for n number of items so n number of orders we want to run the task once a particular task is completed we want to run its dependent task once that dependent task is completed we want to run its a dependent task and so on and so forth and we want this to be done completely independent for every item that we submit what we do not want is we do not even care about how the thread pool is implemented and how it is executing all these tasks internally and of course most important thing is we do not want the main thread to be blocked that is why 
we are saying run this task and run immediately run the dependent task but do not bother me so do not bother the main thread while you do it and this is exactly what completable future was designed for so if we were to convert our existing code which was our earlier code which we wrote in executor service using completable future we would write something like this so completable future provides a function called supply async which is a static function async is short form for asynchronous where we provide a task a method in this case it's a lambda but we provide a way for it to fetch an order so in this case we are saying get the order but do it asynchronously once you receive the order give the output to the next chained method call so in this case the next chain method call is then apply and in this case the input is the variable called order we can name this as anything else so we can say um, the new order and here replace it with new order so just a variable name you can name it anything uh, we named it order so that it's consistent across uh, so it's just a variable so whatever is the input which we got from the previous operation apply the enrich method and pass that particular input to it of course the enrich method itself will give an output which is of course of type order which we again chain it to the next method and here also there is an input variable here we call it order we could have named it say just o and we do perform payment here so if we focus on the right hand side we can clearly see there is a basic algorithm or a basic business logic that we can read through while looking at the code so we are getting the order we are enriching it we are performing the payment we are dispatching the order and we are sending the email completable future lets us do that and if you observed there is nothing where we specify the executor service there is no thread management here there is no future dot get and that is why there is no blocking operation and we are doing this whole flow for 100 operations so all those 100 orders will have this processing done asynchronously and each of the order can at any point in time can be in any of the different stages there is also an overloaded method called then apply async so the difference between apply async and apply is the first thread which is going to do the async operation this is first operation has to be asynchronous always after that the thread which did this first asynchronous operation we can tell that same thread you do all the subsequent operations so in this case that this is the same thread which will do then apply enrich then apply perform then apply dispatch and then apply email but for some reason if you do not want that particular thread to do it which is the same thread pool thread but we want some other thread to do it then we can say async and when you do async the first operation will be done by a particular thread and the second operation is done by some other thread so you can replace all of them with async but there is no practical advantage to doing that except when you want to specify your own thread pool so in essence you can also specify your own thread pool by passing it as a parameter here so if i do control p it is showing that yes that's an overloaded method first one which takes only the supplier the second one which takes supplier and an executor so suppose uh, my two operations one is a cpu bound and one is a io bound so in an io bound operations io bound meaning any file operations any database operations any http calls i want to use an executor service Let's say executor service uh, say cpu bound equal to executors dot new fixed thread pool and it's a CPU bound. I have only CPU size. CPU number of cores is four. So I'll keep the value as four. And I have an IO bound executor service. And in this case, uh, I can have say 200 op threads. Or you could instead have a new cache thread pool. In which case, you do not have to specify the number of threads. So when you are getting the order, which say it's an IO bound operation. So you can say no 
execute this not in your own thread pool but in the thread pool that I am supplying so this will be diff so this operation will be performed in the IO bound executor service which we defined here and let's say uh, the enrichment operation if it's a CPU bound operation it doesn't have to connect to any database or any external network then we can have it CPU bound here now IntelliJ IDEA is giving us an error here because the thread which was going to do the first operation we are asking that same thread to apply the second operation but we are giving the two different executor service here of course one thread cannot belong to two different executor services and that is why here we have to say run it as an asynchronous operation and now the error is gone and that is why you have this overloaded method which is useful if you are going to run your method or your tasks in different thread pools right uh, again perform payment is uh, let's say so I'll do an async and I want to do it in an IO bound uh, executor service so I'll say IO bound so ba based on whether your tasks are a mixture of IO bound and CPU bound operations or for some other reason you want to execute it on different executor services these async calls can help and just to clarify this whole thing whether you say then apply async or then apply even then the whole thing is still being done off the main thread the main thread will never be blocked this whole for loop will run immediately for 100 times and then the thread pools internally will take care of everything uh, we skipped over one part which is let's say we do not use any executor service what happens then what is being used internally internally it uses a folk join pool dot common pool let's check that out so if we go into the JDK code, it's applying some stage into this async pool. And this async pool is of the type folk join pool dot common pool. Okay, this is the default pool that if you do not provide any, then it will use this default pool to run all your tasks. Of course, it's a business logic flow. There could be exceptions in between. So there is also a way to handle your exceptions, wherein say, let's say the perform payment failed. In case of exceptions, in any of the operations above so if in any of these three operations we have any exception or any problems this method which is like catch block will be called and in this catch block we can say whatever is the exception uh, for now i'm not caring what the exception is but i want to return a failed order method or a failed order object instance which will then be continued here so in the dispatch order we can write that okay if it's a failed order then please do not proceed with anything else but if it's a normal order then please proceed with the dispatch and a send email will work as is if it's a failed order it will send an appropriate failed email right so this is how you can handle exceptions in the completable future having said that if your exceptions or if your business logic is slightly more complicated then this might not be the right way to go more often than not when you have large projects your business logic is much more complicated and that is when completable future does not seem like the right option because there are a lot of constraints and a lot of if else conditions that you want to have uh, and completable future does provide you a few methods so there are methods which will say combine where you can combine two uh, different completable futures and such but they are still a little complicated and in this case I highly suggest that you look at this framework called a reactive framework which is RX Java uh, which is very popular which is very stable and which is used by most of the large companies and uh, that also performs the same uh, thing as completable future but it's much more feature rich and it's much more easier to read and write the code in. Uh, so that's it for this video guys thanks a lot uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, let me know and uh, see you in the next one thank you